One of the most tragic events that happened during the Ronald Reagan presidency was the Sunday morning terrorist bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut, Lebanon. Now some of you guys might be old enough to remember this event and maybe a lot of you guys don't know what I'm talking about but it is a true historical event in which hundreds of Americans were killed or wounded as they slept that day. For many who lived through the 1960s, they remember this terrible scene as the survivors worked to you know, dig out their trapped brothers from beneath all that rubble. But one of the most inspirational stories about this incident involves a Marine Corps commander named Paul Kelly who visited some of the wounded survivors who were transported to a hospital in Germany. Among them was a corporal named Jeffrey Nashton who was very damaged in this incident. Nashton had so many tubes running in and out of his body that a witness said that he didn't even look human, but he looked more like a machine. But somehow, by God's grace, he survived. As Commander Kelly came near him, Mr. Nashton, who was struggling to move in his bed, motioned for a piece of paper and a pen. And on this, he wrote a brief note and passed it to the commander. And it wasn't a message of despair or anger or questioning or hopelessness. But rather, on the slip of paper were these two simple words. Semper fi, which is a saying in Latin of the Marines meaning forever faithful. And with these two simple words... Corporal Nashton spoke for the millions of Americans in that area who have sacrificed their life and limb and, you know, all these things for their country. Those who have, in these two words, remained faithful. In fact, the story of devotion and perseverance is a story of many in the military over the many years, which is why we should hold these people in high esteem because of their sacrifice and their integrity. You see guys, there are many things that are worth fighting for in life. But I would say nothing is more pressing than the issue of persevering in the faith and being faithful to obey the Lord, no matter how difficult the circumstances around us are. Because the world is going to cause us to want to go in a different direction. It's going to want us to complain against God. It's going to want us to abandon the Lord God. It's going to want us to live in selfish, sinful, evil, depraved ways. Which is why Jesus so many times told us not to go down that route. Not to give up. Not to go in the way of danger and condemnation. And this is why... The gospel is so, so beautiful. Because in it, we see a reason why we should persevere. We see meaning in life and we see a hope in life. But Jesus says many times that it's not going to be an easy journey. We're going to sacrifice a lot. We're, some of us might even sacrifice our lives. But in the end, the Lord God is going to stand with us and we're going to be victorious. And that is the theme of the message we're going to be looking at today in Revelation chapter 14. To sum it up again, Revelation is a book that speaks about the consummation of world history. So it basically talks about how the world is going to end. And it's going to end in a good way because God wins at the end. And in last week's passage, we saw how the false prophet came onto the scene. How this is a religious figure who comes on to help the political figure, the Antichrist, in trying to spread his evil rule all around the world and to get people to worship the Antichrist instead of the Lord God. So it's a very big picture of doom and gloom and sadness and darkness. But in chapter 14... This one that we're going to be looking at today, we see a bright contrast with this picture of this group that did not give in to the Antichrist's way, but they persevered. God is talking about the 144,000 who have not sided with Satan. And this gives us a reason 
why we need to persevere in the faith, why we need to love God and to obey his commandments, because in the end, no matter what the cost is, the Lord God is going to be with us and he's going to vindicate us, just like he does with these 144,000 in the future. So this passage reveals two compelling reasons why we are to follow Jesus and persevere in the faith. The first compelling reason to follow Christ is that followers of Jesus are honored. That's the first point. They are saved and they're also honored. Because we think that we're going to lose a lot. We suffer so much shame and disappointment in the eyes of the world and the Antichrist. But if God is the one who's going to honor us, that should be all that matters in life. And we see that in the first five verses together. So if you have your Bibles, open it up. We're going to start looking at the first five verses of point number one. So beginning with verse one, it says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. So John, the apostle, now shifts in his vision to look at the 144,000. Okay, let's see what's going on with these people. And we see that they have done their evangelism ministry. They have persevered all the way to the end. And it says that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, was standing next to this group on Mount Zion. And this right here, brothers and sisters, is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. In Zechariah chapter 14 that said when Jesus the Messiah comes back, that he's going to stand on that mountain and he's going to stand with his Jewish people whom he has redeemed in the last day. What a wonderful testament to the faithfulness of God to carry out his promises to redeem his elect Israel. And we see here in the picture of the 144,000, those who have survived. They were preserved by God, and now God is going to stand with them. They did not take the mark of the beast. They did not sell their souls to the devil, but it says instead they had the mark of God on their forehead instead, and they were willing to die with the mark of God on their head. Praise the Lord. And it's so great because we know that at the same time, it was the Lord God who was preserving them. He was protecting their faith. He was the one who preserved them all the way to the end. And when Jesus Christ returns at his second coming, he is going to stand with this group in victory. And they have every reason to celebrate. This 144,000 Jewish people, the evangelists from all 12 tribes, these are the ones who are going to survive all the way to the end of the tribulation. And they're going to enter with Jesus into his earthly millennial reign as they will have a special place in that kingdom being used by God to continually spread the good word all around the world. And you want the heavens and everybody is praising the Lord because of his redeeming work. Look at what it says in verses 2 to 3. John says, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. So this praise is also seen in heaven. It says right here that the chorus of praise was happening all over heaven. The harp was an instrument of joy. And we see that heaven cheers because they know Jesus Christ is about to carry out his promises. He's going to come back to the world. He's going to get rid of all the evil in the world. And all of heaven is celebrating that Jesus Christ is about to take his place as king over the world. And in fact, they were even singing this really interesting song. It says that it was a new song that they were singing before the throne and before the four living creatures and elders. This song of redemption, this song of praise. But it was also said that it's a song that 
nobody except the 144,000 knows about. Hmm, that's very interesting. Well, of course, unbelievers are not going to sing this song during the tribulation. They're out there singing the song of the Antichrist and his evil ways. But instead, this specific group can sing the song because this song represents redemption. It represents God's goodness. It represents his protection in a special way in this future time. And not only that, look at how faithful these people were too. And I hope this can also be an inspiration to the church, to all of us. It says that these 144,000 have not been defiled with women, for they kept themselves chaste, which means pure. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the lamb. Well, that's a very interesting note because... I'm sure a lot of you guys struggle with sin, especially in our world right now. Imagine what it's like in the future when during the tribulation there's going to be so much sexual immorality and so much idolatry. It's going to tempt even believers to stumble into the sin. But the amazing thing about this group of people, the 144,000, is that they have kept themselves pure. Now, this isn't saying that marriage is a sin in the future. This isn't talking about, you know, sexual relations like in a good way, but rather this is talking about sexual immorality, the worst of its kind. And these 144,000, they didn't go that route. They decided not to give in. They decided not to give in to temptation. They were pure. And this is the reason why their ministry was so powerful because of their purity and their integrity. And I really hope you guys are inspired by this too, because this is a picture of what we are called to do as a church as well, to be above reproach and blameless if possible. And we see a great picture of that in this group. They were pure. They decided to follow Jesus wherever he goes, no matter the cost. These people are the first fruits to God of what is to come. You see, whenever it talks about first fruits, it basically talks about like a portion of something greater that is to come in the future. Now, when we think of first fruits, we're probably thinking about like in the Old Testament when they gave 10% of their produce you know, in trust of God providing the rest of the 90%. And in many ways, we see here a picture of the first fruits of Israel. Because in many ways, we can say like the 12 apostles were the first fruits of, you know, Israel that is to come. But then we see in this 144,000, the first fruits of a redeemed Israel. God carrying out his promises to save the nation of Israel in the last day. And man, look at how, look at how pure these people were. According to verse 5, it says, No lie was found in their mouth, for they were blameless. You see, that world at that time is going to be full of a lot of lies and deceptions, especially by the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all of these like false propagandas going on at this time. But in contrast, the 144,000, they don't lie. They don't even do that. Just think about all the times that we just go around and, you know, we just kind of tell lies and, oh, it's no big deal before God. But within them, it says not even a trace of lie was found in their mouth. Whoa, these are really holy people. Man. You see, in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 13, there was even a prophecy about this remnant of Israel in the future. In Zephaniah, that minor prophet, he says, The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. You see, I hope that this will be of some inspiration to you guys, because, you know, a lot of us think that, oh, it's not a big deal to lie. Everybody lies. Why lies? Things like that. You know, I've, one time I heard a story that was very inspiring to me when I heard this because it really showed how much this Christian was really serious about his faith. So I have a friend who is a dear seminary student as well, and he was a pastor at one time. 
he was telling me a story about how one time in his early days he was working like in a shop i think it was retail i don't really remember for sure but um there was somebody who called wanting to speak to the boss so my friend he basically went to the boss and said hey there's a call for you but you know this boss he didn't really want to talk to this guy you know how it's like sometimes where you want to talk to them and the other side is like, oh, just tell them I'm not here. <laughs> Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, so anyways, this boss decided to pull one of those. He was like, just tell them I'm not here. So then my friend was about to go back and he was about to tell him over the phone, but he was thinking as my, wait a minute, I can't tell that lie. That's not Christian of me to do that. What kind of example would that be? Not just in terms of my faith, but also to this boss. So he went back to the boss and he said, I'm sorry, but I just can't lie. You know, I can't, I, I have to tell the truth. I can't lie to him. So this boss was like, ah, or, or, or whatever. So he just went out of the office and basically went to take the call. But then, you know, of course, my friend could have felt a little bit bad about that because you know obviously his boss was not happy he might have even gotten fired but then the thing was that his boss came back to the office like a moment later and you know what he said to my friend he said you know what now that I think about it we need more people like you in the workforce you're a man of integrity you know in the same way if he could do that before his boss how come we can't do that before God? I mean, we think of it as a small thing, but you know, the Lord, he loves faithfulness in small areas. So next time, if you're ever in that situation, don't feel that it's bad or inappropriate or weird that you're standing up for your integrity, even in this small area, because the Lord is going to remember that. That's what it means to be blameless before God is that you are trying your best, even in small areas, to honor the Lord in purity and righteousness. So the whole lesson behind this is really simple. God is going to not just save his people, but he's going to honor those who are faithful to him. So we see that in the picture of the 144,000, that these people really went through hell in order to serve the Lord. But, you know, look what happens at the other end of the tunnel. It says Jesus was standing with them on Mount Zion when he returns. And in the same way, don't you want Jesus to also stand with us and honor us as well, saying, good job, my, my faithful servant, because you have not compromised, and even in small areas. You are faithful to obey my commandment. It just really shows how much the Lord hates sin and how much he loves purity. And that's why we, all of us here in this room, you in the camera, as well as everybody in this room, this is an area that I hope will inspire us to holiness. But then again, there's also the other crowd out there who really don't care about any of that. And that's exactly why we need to see the second compelling reason we must follow Christ and to persevere in the faith. Because Here's point number two. Rejectors of Jesus are condemned. I think we've heard this many times before, but Sue, rejectors of Jesus are condemned. And we see this in verses 6 through 13. So John continues and says, And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of water. Okay, by this time, after the ministry of the 144,000 witnesses, as well as, you know, the two witnesses, a lot of the world is going to hear the gospel. But then it's going to be a fact after this one angel appears in the sky to proclaim the gospel so that everybody in the world can hear. 
So why is this an eternal gospel? Because it has eternal implications. If you guys don't know what the gospel is, it's this. It's that we sinners, because of our sins, are condemned to eternity in hell as a result of sinning against the Lord God. But God, in his love, sends his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross on our behalf as a substitute so that our death penalty can be taken away, so that God takes, or Jesus takes the wrath of God upon himself as a substitute so that our sins can be forgiven. Because if our sins are not forgiven, then we don't have eternal life, but we have eternity in hell. It's a gospel with eternal implications. And he preaches this to everybody in the world. So this isn't just a message for the United States of America. This isn't just a message for Israel or, you know, some of the Middle Eastern countries around there. It says every nation and tribe and tongue. So it doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist or if you are a Muslim or a Hindu. It doesn't matter if you're from Thailand or Vietnam or from Canada. This pertains to everybody because if... Everybody in the world doesn't respond and there is an eternal implication to it. That's why missions work is so important. So this angel, literally, he appears in the sky and he preaches in a way where everybody in the world hears him. Isn't that crazy? I mean, if that were me, I would be like, whoa, that's like the ultimate advertising spot up there. Imagine how many companies would actually pay for that. But this message is more important than anything this world can ever advertise. And as a result, the whole world is going to hear. That's why Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 14, he rightly says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So I know we all think that we need to do all this missionary work around the world to spread the gospel, that we're the ones responsible for getting it all around the world. I mean, God gives us that command, and of course we should press on to do this work. But just remember, it is God himself in the future who's going to make that possible during the tribulation, period. And he tells the world, he says, you got to fear God and give him glory. This is basically angel telling people around the world, you need to repent and believe in the gospel. That's another way of saying it. Because all of us think that coming to Jesus is basically just believing in him in some intellectual sense, or maybe just accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But a lot of this fear and repentance aspect is always removed from modern day evangelism, which is why this is so important to take in mind. Because coming to faith in Jesus Christ True faith will involve a fear of the Lord because of your sins. A fear of not just punishment, but also his holiness. And giving him glory, meaning we're going to turn our life around and give glory to God and not give glory to another thing in the world. That's what true faith is. That's what repentance is. That's what this angel is telling the world. That's why he doesn't say, you guys got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because he loves you so much. He's telling them, you are going to have to fear the Lord and you're going to have to give him glory, which means you're going to have to repent because of all your evil. Because the hour of judgment has come, meaning the time is coming now. So before I move on and say anything else, I want to encourage you guys, because now that we're talking about it, now that it just, just came into my mind right now, use this as an example to look at even your own faith to see if you have responded in the same way as well. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of soft, watered-down gospel Christianity out there that does not look anything like what's talked about here. Because true faith, as much as it involves, you know, accepting the love of God and things like that, it also involves, you know, a disgust over sin, a fear of the Lord, and giving Him all glory, which means abandoning worldliness and turning to Christ and following Him. Is that what your faith looks like today? Because if that's not what your faith looks like, and Jesus is still in the backseat of your car, or he's like 10th place in your life, then you do not fear God. You are not giving him glory. And today you need to fix that before it is too late. Don't live in deception. 
Because if you do, if you get it wrong, Jesus makes it clear many times that in the last days, many will say to him, Lord, Lord, and Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you phony. Claiming to be a Christian, but yet you have never truly gotten right with me. It's really a serious message. Because, you know, like in the future, and this is what verse 8 says, that even with this angel, when he preaches to everybody, you know what happens? A lot of them don't turn to God. That's why those bold judgments continue, because they didn't repent. And that's extremely sad. In verse 8, that's why another angel comes onto the scene, and it says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great so basically, the angel comes onto the scene because the people have not repented. This message was like ignored, and they continue to follow the Babylonian system that dominated the world in the future. Now, to give you a little bit of a background of what's going on here, because you look at Babylon, you're thinking, what in the world? What, what's all this about? Well, if you remember, Babel, Babylon started as this little city in which people build this tower to try to go all the way to the heavens. And this is like a testament to the pride and evil of humanity. And that's why God had to disperse them. But according to many scholars and historians, Babel is where all this false religion in the world came from. So the spirit that was in Babel followed people all around as they dispersed all around the world. And that's how we got these other religions that pop up in other parts of the world like a, some, this satanic, man-centered spirit within it. And interestingly, Babylon was even one of the world empires in the past. It was the empire that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in the 6th century BC, if you guys remember that. But then in the future, apparently, there might even be a restored city of Babylon. So Babylon right now is in the country of Iraq. It's kind of near Baghdad, I don't know if you guys know what Iraq looks like or if you've been there before, but apparently this, this text is saying that there might actually be a restored Babylon in the future, which is the Antichrist headquarters. But the Babylon is also this religious spiritual system that enslaves all the nations so that through this religion, people worship idols and they practice immorality and they are stuck in this system which is really really tragic but god is saying you want to live for babylon you want to commit immorality with babylon you want to ignore my message then i am going to lay the smack down on babylon it's going to be destroyed this world system is going to be destroyed but then there's also another message, not just a world system that's going to be judged, but individual souls will be judged as well. That's what the third angel talks about in verse 9. Look what he says here. So the third one follows and says, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. If there's any passage that should cause us to really dread, especially if we're not in Christ, it, it's this one right here. Because Jesus is saying that judgment is not just going to end with things that you see in the world. He says judgment is going to be eternal on the individual person. Because if you guys remember in the last passage we looked at, the false prophet is the one who helps implement what's called the mark of the beast in which people take a mark on their right hand or on their forehead to indicate their allegiance to the Antichrist, basically their allegiance to Satan. And if people don't take it, then they can't buy, they can't sell, and many of them are put to death. So that's why it's a very big dilemma for Christians in the future, believers. 
because a lot of people think by taking the mark, they're going to be saving themselves, but in the end, they're going to lose their soul. Do you remember when Jesus said that, what does a profit a man if he is to gain everything in the world but forfeit his soul? That's why this is so, so tragic and so, so scary. Because God's wrath, according to verse 10, it says that it's going to be full strength. You know, in Greek, it literally means undiluted. Basically, you know, at the time when they were to mix wine together, sometimes they would dilute it by putting water in it so that it wouldn't be as strong and potent. But Jesus is saying that this future judgment in the lake of fire is going to be undiluted, which means that it's going to be full strength judgment on those who have failed to repent. Because any judgment that God has poured out in life, even in this world, is diluted to some degree because it's not as bad as it could possibly be. But in the future, in this eternal hell called the lake of fire, it's going to be undiluted. It is going to be pure wrath that's going to be poured out upon those who have failed to believe in Jesus. They will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Look at how graphic it is. He's using this imagery of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 17 to really depict the horror of the lake of fire judgment that is coming for those who die in their sins. In which they will be tormented in the presence of Jesus Christ and all the saints forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. You know, there's a lot of people out there and because I'm, you know, I'm even thinking about this right now because to me it is very tragic whenever I hear these things. Believe it or not, it's even being taught within some churches out there too. They say that hell is not eternal. That it's not as bad as it can be. Now, of course, if you say that there is no hell, then you, you're what's called a universalist. You're a heretic. But then there are also another group of people within the church who say that there is a hell, but it's only temporary. So basically, you don't really have any reason to fear. There was a 19th century British Congregationalist minister named Robert Dale who didn't believe in eternal punishment. So he was one of those pastors who didn't believe in it for whatever reason. Yet before he died, interestingly, Dale sighed and said this, no one fears God nowadays. So basically what he's saying is that if you remove God's wrath and the concept of eternal hell within your teaching, especially in gospel presentation and evangelism, then you're basically going to give people no reason to fear God and to come to him. And that is a major problem because the reason he gives us this passage is to tell us why you need to fear God. Because there is serious judgment that is coming in the future. It is intense. It is scary. So that is why today you need to take up your offer of salvation while it's still there. Because if you don't, then there is eternal punishment waiting. That is really bad. But then again, in verse 12, you know, he jumps right back once again to the picture of the saints in order to encourage those who are in the faith, no matter how difficult it seems. It says, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So on the other side, there are these people who are praised by God. They're loved by God. Do you know why they're loved by God? Because it says here, because they keep the commandments of God because of their faith in Jesus. Now, there are many people even today who claim to be a Christian, but yet their lives are marked by no obedience to the Lord whatsoever. Worldly, sinful, hypocritical people who think that they're going to go to heaven when they die. But in reality, they have no such ticket to the Lord. 
Because if you are truly in the faith, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, then you should be marked by a life of love and obedience. That's what it means to be born again, because salvation is a work in which God sends His Holy Spirit to give you new life, to give you the faith, and to start working within you so that you can be you know, going up like a, like a good stock market company. That's how your life is supposed to look like. But if it's like going like this, or maybe even like this, you got reasons to worry. That's why I read earlier from John chapter 14, verses 23 to 24. Remember this, brothers and sisters. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So that is why this group is so awesome, because even under the pressure of the Antichrist, in all his tyranny, these people do not abandon Jesus, but they continually obey his commandments, even if it's really hard and gruesome because of the persecution and the harassment. It's a lesson to us as well. I'll give you an example. There was a noble hero of the Spartans. His name was Leonidas. He lived in the 6th century. He defended Greece from the Persians. And he was in battle against thousands of invaders. And one of his men said, General, when the Persians shoot their arrows, there are so many of them that they darken the sky. But Leonidas replied, Then we will fight in the shade. So the lesson behind this is simple. We must continue to serve the Lord and fight the good battle, no matter how gloomy and dark our circumstances are in this world. Because like I said, there is a cost of following Jesus. Even Jesus himself during his ministry did not sugarcoat that. Because that's not just a word for future tribulation people. That's a word for us as well. He didn't sugarcoat anything. He says that if you follow me, it's going to be costly. That's what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross and to follow him. Because you're going to give up a lot to follow Jesus. And maybe some of us will even lose our lives. But you know what? God is saying, it's okay. If they take your life, you're not going to lose it. I'm not going to cheer on the enemies right there. In fact, I got your back. That's why he says in the last verse in 13, write this, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And the Holy Spirit, you know what he says? He says, yes so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. So God is saying, if they take your life, it's okay. It's okay because you are going to be blessed. There's two ways you're going to be blessed. First of all, if you die in this world, you're going to have rest. You don't have to struggle with all the sins and all the hardships and all the garbage and injustice that you experience in this world. You're going to be okay. You're going to be at rest. But then also, look at what it says here because this one is one of those last words that I really hope you guys listening, whether here at Nassung or anywhere else, will remember because this will basically determine your future stance when you are in the kingdom. It says their deeds will follow them. Whatever we do in this world, if it's for God, it's going to follow us to heaven. Because we think that it's all about building our treasures on earth, all about building all this material wealth and all that stuff. But that's why Jesus is saying, build your treasures in heaven because whatever goes there in heaven is not going to get lost. Everything that you do here, whether it's evangelism, whether it's persevering in the faith, whether it's giving your money to missions organizations or churches, you know, whatever that stuff is, he's saying it's good because it's all going to follow you to heaven. It's not going to be lost. It's going to be there. That's the reason why we should persevere. Because especially during the Antichrist future reign, people are going to do whatever they can to build up all their treasures on earth. But then God is saying, don't focus on that. 
Build up your treasures in heaven because the deeds that you do here, even if the world makes fun of you for it, it's going to follow you all the way to heaven. So in summation, the victory of the saints and the judgment of the wicked is meant to show us this, really simple, that God is going to judge. And this is a reason why we should believe in Jesus and to persevere in the faith without compromise. So really, when it comes down to it, there's only really two choices in life. Either follow Jesus or don't follow Jesus. Because today, we don't have an antichrist with us right now. We don't have the tremendous pressure. So I hope this is going to give you some motivation to get right with God today. He's not asking for your money. He's not asking that you... Get on your knees and say Hail Mary ten times. He's asking you to change your attitude in life, especially towards God. He says, if you want to be saved, do as scripture says. Fear God and give him all the glory, which means repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you'll be saved. And let me tell you, it's going to be tough. And this is really the last closing thing that I want to exhort you guys. Because the message of this sermon is very simple. Because he lays it out for here at least twice already. He calls us persevere in the faith. Don't give in to worldliness, which is run by the spirit of the Antichrist today. So basically, don't defile yourselves with idols and sexual immorality and You know, all these untruths within you, all these lies. He's saying, persevere in the faith and do what is right all the way to the end. And in the end, God is going to stand with you. And that's all that matters. In closing, there was a great evangelist named George Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelists who had ever lived. One of his most famous quotes was this. I had a day in my life When I surrendered in consecration to the Lord and that day I said, I call heaven and earth to witness that I give up myself entirely to be a martyr for him who hung on the cross for me. I have thrown myself blindfolded and without reserve into his mighty hands. So I really hope that if that's you today, then you will continue that attitude because of course God is saying, You will be rewarded for that. I'm going to stand by you. So today, especially if you have not done that, do that today. Give your life to the Lord in its fullest. And the end is going to be so, so beautiful. Let's pray. So at this moment, as we are reflecting upon God's word in Revelation chapter 14, We see God's responses to two different groups of people during the tribulation. Ask yourself, which group do you most identify with? And how can you be sure of it? So if you are not a Christian here today and you are still thinking about this whole faith thing, Really listen to the Lord's words because it's not complicated. It's very simple. You have sinned against God. Punishment and justice is coming. It is horrific. But yet the Lord made a way for you to be forgiven of your sins. Through God's justice. By taking God's wrath upon himself and resurrecting on the third day. And today, if you heed the Lord's words to repent of your sins and place your trust in the living Son of God, then you will be saved. And if you need to do that today, then I pray, please do that. Come before the Lord humbly and earnestly, asking for his forgiveness, asking for his righteousness, asking for his Holy Spirit. 
And I want to exhort you guys, if you are in the faith, continually ask the Lord to give you the spirit of perseverance in anticipating the Lord's coming as well as living holy as he has called us to live. A people not given over to idols or sexual immorality or lies, but people who are given over to all purity and righteousness. And I want that to be your prayer today because you will experience the same temptations in this world. If you are not careful, ask that the Lord would empower you and embolden you, just like these 144,000 witnesses. So thank you once again, Lord, for your gift of salvation. And we pray, Lord, that our songs that we sing unto you will be the cry from our heart indicating our thankfulness and our willingness to die for you. And all this we lift up in your son's name. Amen.